So this is the eleventh talk that we're going to have in AP Bio, and it deals with ecological interactions. In particular, how do different organisms interact with each other inside of ecosystems? Whole bunches of learning objectives that deal with this, and there's even parts from the book that deal with it. So your job as an organism inside of your ecosystem or your community is referred to as your niche. And whenever you have a niche, there's what you could potentially do, and then there's what you really do end up doing. So we're not going to deal with the what you could do version, a fundamental niche, where you'll deal with the realized or the here's actually what you do version of the niche. In all versions of a niche, there are going to be two types of interactions that you have to deal with. One of them is you're going to deal with your own type, your own species, and then you're going to have to deal with other species. So one of those ones is you're going to have to deal with like I said, your own type. And those interactions turn out to be kind of complicated, but what are even more complicated are the, you're interacting with your not, or not your type. So other species. I could probably have worded that better. Details. So when we look at things like a tree, which you wouldn't think of as being an ecosystem, but lots of different organisms live there. So yes, it turns out to be its own ecosystem. And You'll get stratification of organisms, and they will separate out because of how they need to interact. Sometimes their niches are very, very, very similar. So because of that, you get some evolutionary changes going on so that you don't overlap. Because when things overlap and two different species have the same niche, something bad's going to happen. So <coughs> if you're dealing with you're within your same species. Typically, you're fighting over the resources that everyone needs. Collectively, you're going to get food, shelter, and space. But what not, what turns out not to be guaranteed for your species would be things like reproduction. So a lot of inter, or pardon me, intraspecific competition, like these two male giraffes fighting each other, would be over a mating partner, which seems kind of silly, but a lot of time is spent on it. And if you don't believe me, look at humans and all the things that people do just to say, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. When we have intra or interspecific interactions, what you can deal with are situations of mimicry, meaning you have one organism trying to look like another. In this particular case here, the one on the right, the monarch butterfly, is toxic. So if you consume it, it's going to poison you. The one on the left, the, vi the viceroy butterfly, isn't toxic. But it evolved to look like the monarch butterfly by chance. It happens to look like it. And the benefit that the mo viceroy butterflies have is they don't get eaten because other organisms mistake them for being monarchs. So we have one form of mimicry where one organism is harmful and the other mimics it to hope that it doesn't get hurt. The other form of mimicry is everything is similar. This has been seen with poisonous or dangerous species. And typically, they all are bright. They're brightly, brightly colored. It's why if you had some type of insect and it's yellow and it flies at your face, odds are you're going to freak out because you're going to think wasp or hornet or bee even though it could be a fly, and there are flies that are yellow. But that's not what you think. You think bee, wasp, hornet, and you're not going to mess with it. This one here follows the pattern of the bright colored, but <coughs> it's not mimicking any other type of organism. But this is called the blue-ringed octopus because it has blue rings on it. It turns out to be really, really, really insanely venomous. So if you get bitten by one, it's probably going to kill you. And by pro I say probably because it depends on where you are when you get bitten. Other forms of interactions or mimicries could be you could be mimicking a totally different species that is nowhere close to you, like a gecko mimicking a tree. So this is camouflage or, crypto or cryptic colorism. There's another word for it, but I can't remember it right now. I'm sure I'll put a little flash or shout out to say that, but it's a way of hiding. Turns out other things cause trouble too. Potatoes, poison. Tomatoes, poison. 
cashews. Poison! Seriously, these foods be scary. Howdy folks, Trace here for DNews. We usually don't give much thought to where our food comes from, but sometimes the things you learn can surprise you. Tomatoes, for a long, long time, were not part of Italian cooking, but then Europeans were introduced to them by locals here in the Americas. In the 1500s, the seeds were brought back to Italy and became wildly popular. Boom! Italian farmers, Italian people, had no tomato in their cooking. Imagine Italian cooking without tomatoes. Double boom! Ready for a triple boom? Tomatoes are poisonous! Ha ha ha! Triple boom! Seriously, this fruit we eat all the time is actually part of a plant that contains the same poison as deadly nightshade known as glycoalkaloid. If you were to eat a tomato vine, your tummy would be unhappy and you would experience some minor central nervous system issues. The fruit, in the United States, it is legally a vegetable because of an 1893 Supreme Court case, Nix versus Hedden. Tax reasons, don't worry about it. It's a fruit. <coughs> is not the only member of the deadly nightshade family that we eat. The beloved potato is also a suspect. While the tuber can be safely eaten when fresh, if allowed to sit in the sun, the lowly potato will build more poisonous glycoalkaloid. And in case you're not freaked out enough, the part above the plant, you know, that grows above ground, that contains leaves and stems, it also grows these cute little berries. Don't eat those berries. Those little guys contain 10 to 20 times the glycoalkaloid and they will lay you out, son. So before we start trekking too far into this miasma of poisonous foods, let me be frank. Tomatoes and potatoes are not going to kill you. They are tasty and they are safe to eat. Many of the foods we eat are part of plants which if we consumed whole would cause us issues. Cashew shells, for example, contain urushiol, which is the same chemical that's on poison ivy. However, when roasted and salted, the pit of those little cashew apples is delicious. Yes, please. The lovely almond is trying to kill you too, though you thought it was friendly. <laughs> no, it's not. Bitter almonds are a seed and they contain hydrogen cyanide. Yeah. That cyanide. Raw almonds sold in stores aren't really raw, even though the packaging says so. Since 2007, it's actually been illegal to buy raw almonds in the US. Simply heating them up will destroy the poison inside their tasty bodies. But their relatives, the tasty cherry, plump little apple, fancy peach, yummy apricot, they contain cyanide too, but only in the seeds and the pits. So just, you know, don't eat that bit. The list goes on. Poisonous foods are all around you all the time, but it's okay. We like to live dangerously. How did we come to find out about all these things? Trial and error, my friends. Trial and error. We are still exploring this. Think about the pufferfish. Look at that cute little guy. Deadly. He'll kill you. The pufferfish contains tetrodotoxin, which is 1,200 times more potent than cyanide, but that pufferfish contains enough poison to kill 30 people. People still eat it, even though occasionally someone does die. Why? I don't know. Adventure? Culinary excitement? I haven't tried it. Do these poisonous delights freak you out? Tell us your feelings on these hidden and plain sight poisons in the comments, and be sure you come find us on Facebook and Google+. Plus. You won't regret it. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. Catch you later. So, yeah. Plants fight back. They have interactions, too. So, outside of mimicking each other and trying to murder each other, we have other types of interactions, too. So here we happen to have a list of a few of them. Oh, so like commensalism is one organism is fine or benefits from this relationship. The other one doesn't seem to care. Mutualism, both of them turn out to work out to their mutual benefit. Parasitism, one of them is sucking the life sometimes out of the other. So one benefits, the other one suffers. Predation is one of those or herbivorism. So being an herbivore turns out to be one of those. So it's a form of parasitism. This parasitism, the goal is not to kill. If you're a predator or you're an herbivore, the goal is to kill. <clears throat> but all of these types of interactions turn out to make for complications. And again, those complications or those complicated interactions we call food webs. In some cases, it deals with one organism eating another organism, and other times it's we're here to help you out. So it, some of them show up in the form of food webs and others don't show up at all, especially when it comes to things like mutualism and commensalism. There you don't necessarily see it in a food web, but if you have predation or herbivorism, or parasitism, it shows up in a food web.